Good morning to our Cranley community. I hope you are all well and obviously feeling refreshed after the National Day break and not long to go till the end of term. Um, I don't know where this term has gone and I cannot believe we've come to the end of our term one, um, Cranley Connects Coffee Mornings, um, but I'm so excited to welcome our special guest and speaker and parent um, of, of our community this morning. Just going to bring on um, Dr. Vadlana. If I've said, if I've pronounced it correctly, I was just having yes. a discussion with her about the best way to pronounce her wonderful name. Um, I feel quite special about and humbled about the speaker today. Um, I've had a lot of contact with um, Dr. Vajana, how she's helped um, sixth form students last year on their transition. And the fact is that you are a friendly community parent, which makes it even more special. So in advance, thank you so much for your time. Um, Dr. Vajana is a clinical psychologist and a wellness counsellor, and she's a counselling team leader at NYU Abu Dhabi. So um, we have a wealth of experience in front of us this morning and thank you in advance for your time Dr. Vajrana. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and welcome you to the Cranley community as a parent um, and especially as a professional and your words of wisdom have inspired me over the last couple of years. So I'm so excited for you to be talking to our Cranley community today. Thank you so much, Mrs. William. Um, first of all, again, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just really uh, excited to be here today. And, uh, you know, we spoke on a number of occasions about this difficult time we're all handling, and I'm just happy to help in any way I can. Um, I just wanted to start off with a very brief introduction of who I am for um, those of you, uh, the parents who don't know me. Um, like Mrs. Williams said, uh, first and foremost, I'm a Cranley parent as well. I have two children at school. Um, my daughter is in year six uh, and my son is in year nine. Um, so maybe there are some parents who have children in the same years, um, especially year nine. We have all struggled with having them at home um, and then having actually um, a lot of effort from school to keep them engaged, which I personally appreciate. And most of all, what I appreciate is the good news of them returning to school in January. Um, as for me, uh, as Mrs. Williams said, um, I work full time um, at the New York University Abu Dhabi in the neighborhood here. Uh, I've been there for five years. Um, at the moment, I obtained the, the uh, function of uh, heading the, the team of counselors at our health center that provides services for students. So what I do as a clinical psychologist at the center, um, I lead my team, but I also provide therapy for our students. So that's what I do on a daily basis. Um, and prior to that, I used to be in a bit of a different uh, arena altogether um, for almost, or yeah, around 15 years um, of, of my work experience was uh, actually uh, within uh, the judicial system, international judicial system. I worked uh, as a victims expert, special victims unit uh, psychologist uh, at the International Criminal Court. Prior to that, the tribunal for ex Yugoslavia, where I originally come from. So that was a whole different experience, uh, but also very valuable um, for what I'm doing uh, these days and also in general. Um, so what we wanted to talk about today, and I acknowledge it's, you know, very late <laughs> in the year that has been very tough for all of us in so many ways. Um, and also it's very late, you know, in this term, but, um, you know, regardless, hopefully it will still be helpful. Uh, we wanted today to talk a little bit about, you know, um, common issues and challenges that we are all facing at this time. Uh, and still probably will be facing for a while. And that's why we wanted to talk about managing anxiety um, connected to uh, the situation we're in with COVID and how can we boost resilience? How can we actually manage it in a way that is sustainable and that is um, you know, going to support us and our children to continue and reduce any harm um, in the process? And so I will 
kick off now with my presentation. I have um, not too many slides. This shouldn't take more than 20 to 30 minutes of me talking. But feel free to interrupt if you have questions. If you don't want to interrupt, um, then please keep them for later. But we will have plenty of time uh, for questions later. I hope you have some. If you don't, that's OK, too. OK, let's start. Uh, first of all, I wanted to define uh, the, the things um, and challenges we are talking about today so that we are all on the same page. So what exactly do we mean when we say anxiety? It's one of those buzzwords um, that is used in, in everyday language for so many things and definitely a buzzword um, for a while now. Uh, I just want to normalize it. It's a normal human response to uncertainty, anticipated threat, you know, be it real physical threat, but also psychological threat, uh, you know, any kind of uncertainty and definitely lack of control. So we as humans, we really don't like that. We like to be in control, obviously. Um, I also want to say, um, if you didn't know that, maybe you knew this already, our brains uh, in terms of evolution and how they work um, even biologically and, you know, uh, brain chemistry wise, they are, the brain is wired to be anxious. So the baseline for the brain itself is to be anxious. This really stems from um, the caveman era even. Uh, our brain is very sophisticated, but it didn't really develop super much since then. And so we have pretty much the same brain. Uh, like cavemen had only, it's a little bit more refined with some, you know, higher intellectual functions, obviously through stimulation that we had over millions of years. But in its essence, in baseline, it's anxious. It's actually a uh, baseline is to anticipate threat, to be prepared for danger in order to survive. And so that's why uh, there's always a bit of a struggle not to feel anxious because the brain always pulls us back to that state of mind. So there also, there's, there's some usefulness to anxiety, right? It wouldn't be there if there wasn't. So it's not completely useless. Um, so it keeps us prepared, but also the problem is that if it is, you know, too much uh, and all the time, um, then it holds us back in many um, aspects of life. It's exhausting in the long run, obviously. Uh, that's why we will feel drained if you're constantly anxious or for a longer period of time. The, the, the problem, additional problem is that it's contagious. Uh, I'm sure you, you have all felt it at some point. And we have to be especially vigilant as parents um, that, you know, it's contagious also between us and our children. So our children perceive always, you know, and I'm sure most of you have noticed that um, already. They perceive more um, than, than we think or th than they give away. And so they will always perceive negative emotions as well, which are part of life. But, you know, when it comes to managing this overall anxiety that is around us, we have to manage our own, but also the anxiety of our children. And that's just really, really difficult. So contagious in that sense, yes, definitely transfers uh, to our social environment, whoever is around us, as well as we can actually get, um, you know, get anxious only because somebody else around us is anxious. Uh, and many times anxious reactions are disproportionate to the trigger, as we say in psychology, which is, you know, whatever caused the reaction, an event, a thought, uh, a news, you know, um, and many times we just overreact and that's why um, anxiety is just so exhausting. Now we move on to uncertainty. What do we mean by that? Obviously, you know, not knowing what's going to happen next, not being entirely sure what's going to happen. So we are living in this really huge amount of uncertainty around us uh, for the past at least uh, nine to ten months. Now, um, it's very hard to take long term. And at this point, we are talking about kind of long term already. It's not a, a crisis anymore. It's prolonged um, crisis. And then, um, you know, it, it makes us crave control more than usual, right? It's this paradoxical reaction of knowing that you don't have control and then you want it even more, obviously. 
increases anxiety, of course, but also depression, right? So that's why, you know, um, people can now start to feel anxious and depressed as a reaction to the situation. And we call that situational depression, situational anxiety. So it's not caused by personal factors as much, but more about the situational factors around us. And then there are differences in individual levels of tolerance for uncertainty for all of us. We are different people. We have different life experiences. So we had so almost like a bit of a different starting point entering this crisis. So we are in the same situation, but maybe we didn't enter it from the same situation. So that can alter, alter our responses. And so some people are you know, due to their life experience, their personality, they can tolerate a lot of uncertainty and still, you know, um, stay composed and, and kind of focused. And some people, they, they, they really get very anxious, even with a little bit of uncertainty. And then, as I said already, as parents, we have to manage uncertainty for us and our children too. And, you know, depending on which generation you belong to, um, also, you know, parents, the rest of the family, you know, we are managing a lot of that, We're almost like stuck in the middle. You have children, but you also have aging parents who are also, you know, in one of the vulnerable groups at this point, and, you know, everybody uh, needs support. And it might just be coming down to us a lot. Resilience. So this is always good news, right? <laughs> in times of anxiety, high anxiety, high uncertainty, ongoing uncertainty, we do still have this thing that we can always go back to and draw from it, which is resilience. And it's part of our mental DNA, right? It's part of our fabric. We just can, you know, boost it maybe a little bit, but we all possess those strengths. So that's always good news. We are wired to be resilient as well as human beings. So resilience is also a buzzword again, but, you know, basically it's the ability to bounce back from adversity, right? Um, and so, because it's just part of life, obviously, as it, this quote also says, like life keeps throwing, you know, uh, curveballs at us and we just need to, you know, manage it and, and sometimes uh, with more effort, uh, but uh, each one of those situations makes us more resilient for the next one. It's definitely the antidote to anxiety you know, because knowing that you have the strength to go through something will reduce your anxiety about the situation. And it's also our level of adapt adaptability to change circumstances. So accepting change and managing change circumstances, that's also resilience. And maybe in terms of attitude, it's this kind of, this will make me, not break me attitude. So sometimes we can use that in our self-talk and kind of like just decide for ourselves that, no, I don't want this to break me. I want it to make me. It's hard. I don't like it, but I want to go through it, and I want to come out on the other side without being broken, just stronger. Now, let's narrow down um, the current challenges we are in, just to connect the dots. So like I said a, a little bit earlier, uh, the situation we are in now with coronavirus is that, you know, it, it turned from crisis, acute crisis, to prolonged crisis, prolonged emergency. So the thing with crisis is that it's very tough, but it's always very limited in time. It's short term. That's why people can go through it, right? Like wildfires, like earthquakes, you know, natural disasters. But this is really ongoing now, it's lingering on. And so that is really taking its toll on, on the, the, the humankind at this point, you know, globally. Uh, there's a danger of second wave. You know, we're seeing it in, in Europe, in the rest of the world, everywhere. Here in UAE, things are being maintained very well. We're so lucky. Uh, but there's that lingering danger of what is it gonna break out again? What's gonna happen? We're hearing about the third waves in, in some parts of the world. So it's, it's very discouraging. There's definitely pandemic fatigue. I just want to acknowledge that. It's, it's a term and also it's reality. Um, people are tired of this pandemic. We all are. You know, we know, okay, yeah, sure, we have to do But, you know, you get tired, like, you, I just want to wake up and have a normal day, you know. Um, but that's not happening just yet. There's decision-making fatigue. Now we're taking decisions as families. Do we travel during the break? Do we 
stay here if we stay here what do we do do we stay at home do we do you know staycations what is good for the children we're constantly as parents also taking decisions for our children do we send them back to school you know deciding about you know what's next so it's not just us so there's a lot of decision making and it's very condensed that you know normally we wouldn't be making the school itself you know all of the teachers the the you know the the um the management of the school everybody is constantly taking decisions and and thank goodness they're keeping us really informed i really want to say how much i personally appreciate it but also you know, uh, in, in terms of the psyche, how helpful that is to reduce anxiety in general, just being informed, just being continuously informed about the changes, what is next, what to expect, and kind of being also kept not just in the loop, but in the decision making process by, you know, uh, offering surveys, asking us for our opinion, and also taking that opinion into consideration. It's very valuable uh, at this time just to be included in that sense. Um, and of course, you know, it's not over yet and we continue to manage uncertainty altogether. So that's also like the biggest challenge of it all. Now, a little bit of good news, but like looking back, what is different now compared to February when it all started, so to speak. Um, okay, vaccine is soon available. This is a fact. Uh, it's just about, you know, there's difference between vaccine and vaccination. So how is that going to be rolled out? So it will take some time till it gets to everybody and starts working. Uh, there's a lot more knowledge about the virus and how it spreads and how to prevent the spread, but we don't know everything still. There's a surprise factor still present. Uh, there's familiarity with prevention, um, you know, of, of the virus, public health and safety measures that we have here and everywhere. And, you know, children are so much more used to like, the, you know, masks are, uh, you know, just such a normal part of the day. Um, you know, there's a lot of that, it, a lot of that explaining that we had to do in the beginning, we don't have to do anymore. Now it's almost like a second nature to all of us, including the little children. And then, um, you know, obviously partial or full return to work for some and school, that was a big deal. That was definitely a big deal. Sense of normalcy, um, or better said that new normal, right? That we have now, um, staggered returns, bubbles, all sorts of things, new terms <laughs> that we all had to learn. Uh, and now include in our everyday language. We have this new normal, it's different from the first shock we had in February or March when it all just started. So there's some movement into the right direction. Again, not over yet. So now we come to practical solutions and, and tips that I have. And, and some of you uh, um, might have been using this already. So uh, it might be a repetition, but sometimes it's just good to get it confirmed by a mental health professional that you know it's a good thing. Um, so first of all, this is a little bit counterintuitive maybe. When it comes to anxiety and feeling it, we have to allow it to be there. So our instinct is to fight back, to box it away, but that's a losing battle. So any negative emotion, including anxiety, that can be very overwhelming, it's unpleasant, you don't want to have it, but it's better to allow it to be there. Imagine just like you're holding it, and it's kind of like ugly, you don't want to look at it, but you have to hold it for a while until it goes away so no pushing back just allowing it without approving you don't like it still but you're allowing it to be there just like a, an annoying piece of something next to you right and then what we can actively do while we are allowing it to be there to make it a little bit shorter and less annoying and less um, burdening is to go back and check the facts you know what am i anxious about am i overreacting is this my opinion or is it a fact? Uh, can I do anything to, you know, change anything in this situation or do I just have to wait it out? And if you're checking the facts about COVID, about school, about, you know, should I travel or not? Should I do this or that or not? Always make sure you're getting information from reliable sources. And that can mean different things to different people. But when you're watching the news, 
choose reliable sources. Don't don't do the anxious scrolling constantly and looking for bad information because you'll find it. Right? When it comes to school, you know, gossip, rumors, that's never a reliable source. It's a good source, it's a big source, but it's not a reliable source. And so, you know, I'd always rather go and directly ask the source, the school, about what's going on and not, not just hold on to the rumors and get more anxious. Um, and then, you know, we can challenge those thoughts. We can think of at least one alternative thought that is not that catastrophic, right? I'm like, how about it means that, you know, how about, you know, like, oh, they will never, like year nine, they will never return to school. This is awful. It's not going to happen. Like, how about they will at some later stage? And look, this happened, you know? And so how about, you know, and neutralize, bring it to a positive zero, like move the needle away from that negativity. You can do that with your head, right? It's a cognitive restructuring. You will not feel it. It will still feel scary and maybe fake to think of a positive outcome. But this is the first step in changing the emotion as well, right? We first have to change the thoughts and then it will be reflected in the emotion just a little bit delayed. But it's good to challenge anxious thoughts while we're allowing anxiety to be there. Anxiety is very physical. It can make you, you know, feel like you're, um, you know, your heart is racing very much and, and, you know, the blood pressure can go up and, you know, it can feel like a really massive physical uh, uh, problem uh, at the time of, you know, you being really busy with anxious thoughts. So it's really good to see where's the anxiety in the body. You can yourself scan the body for anxiety. Where's that pain? Where's that tightness? Is it in the chest? Is it in the head? Where is it? And then narrow it down to that part of the body. So it's not everywhere. And if it's a chest tightness, imagine just your chest being a little bit bigger so it can hold that anxiety, like give it more space, right? So don't do this, right? Because you're not giving that much space. And so you just want to make more space for it until it goes away. Relaxed breathing is very helpful, very helpful, uh, as trivial as it sounds. By that, we mean just paced breathing, right? So for some of you who are doing yoga, you will know it because it's part of the practice. So it's just a little bit slower breathing, not more intense, still through your nose. And you're just counting. Breathing in to the count of three or four, and then breathing out just a little bit longer. Exhales need to be a little bit longer. Because what that does, it lowers your blood pressure, it keeps your heart rate at a nice level, you know, um, and you will feel more calm and it will be easier to think. You can help yourself, you know, with counting and making it paced by using your fingers, counting, giving yourself a rhythm like this. Okay. Um, of course, there's plenty of relaxation exercises, meditation available on the internet, and I'm sure some of you have your own practices that you took hold on to. I'm just recommending some apps here that are really good. Um, those are Calm, 10% Happier, Headspace is amazing. It has also um, stuff for kids, age-appropriate uh, mindfulness exercises, etc. Mindfulness is very good for anxiety. It's a buzzword, I know, again. But mindfulness is just presence, really, okay? So it's not this complicated thing. It's just making you feel more present in the moment, like more sitting in this chair, more staring at the screen, more, you know, like holding on, to like feeling the table, you know, feeling your feet on the ground. That's really mindfulness. So just being mindful of what's around you, right? And for that, we use our senses, all of our senses. So if you're panicking, if you're very anxious, if you're restless, try to use your senses. Don't think for a second, just observe and practice presence. Like, oh, you know, look at this, look at this table. How does it feel? How big is it? What is it made of? Like as, as trivial as it sounds, like what are the colors? What are the smells? You can also do a mindful walk, you know, walk your stress off. Just walk it off. With every step, you leave some of that burden behind and pay attention to what's around you. We live in this beautiful country that has perfect weather all the time. There's so much to enjoy outside. 
just walk it off five minutes not more than that but you will feel the relief and then engaging in my meaningful activities doing the right thing you know just keeping <coughs> yourself busy in in a way that is meaningful to you to your family you know going about daily business bringing kids to school uh, coming back home you know being on some sort of a little schedule of yours for those of us who are working doing the work you know just focusing on what's ahead of us and maybe looking at the day in terms of energy like hour by hour okay so what's next in the next hour how much energy do i need for that and not like feeling tired at the beginning of the day because we are thinking about everything that needs to be done till we go back to bed again so you know like break it down to smaller pieces i'm just mindful of the time so i'll speed it up a little bit um managing ongoing uncertainty of course, you know, as I said before, we all should work a little bit on intentionally increasing tolerance for uncertainty. You know, no matter where we started, it can always be more. So just to be a little bit more accepting of changing circumstances. Um, it's really important in that sense, in that context as well, to know our own personal limits, right? We all have different ones. What, what triggers us? What, you know, what pushes our buttons? It's really good to be mindful of that, not be angry about it, just accept that, yeah, these are my limits and I have to work within those. And then also, you know, it's so important to prioritize things for ourselves, but also for the family. What is the most important stuff for us as a family? What has to be done? What needs to be there? What else we can just, you know, maybe postpone, delay and not pay too much attention to? And then making sure that we get to those priorities on a daily basis. Um, it's so important when we're in uncertainty to, you know, stay connected with others. And sometimes it's, it's not so easy because of the separation and geographical distance and whatnot. And sometimes because of our mood, we just don't feel like showing others that we might be struggling. But it's so important because this gives us sense of comfort and soothes the struggle that we are feeling due to uncertainty. So please, please do pay attention to maintain emotional bonds with people that you're with physically, obviously the family, but also in a broader sense, just keep in touch and, and stay connected and feel connected. Radical self-care is important. Radical, when we say radical in psychology, it's not like in politics, like a bad thing. Radical in psychology means seriously, like take it seriously meaning self-care needs to be on your schedule among your personal and family priorities we take time for self-care and not like oh yeah when i have the time i'll go to that you know whatever massage that i had a voucher for you know for a year no it has to be little acts of self-care kindness taking a breather just taking two minutes to do relaxed breathing taking that mindful walk but really be very serious and intentional about it this is what's needed right now because we are so challenged so it has to be a serious attempt and now i just want to show you uh something that um, i personally use and it's very like it's proven to be very useful for um you know, um, stress management in general, in any context. Um, so this is a model of, you know, called Control Influence Accept model. Uh, uh, the, the acronym is CIA, it's easy to, to remember, it's catchy. So any situation we are facing, we have to see it as threefold. What are parts of the situation I can control, 100% within my control? Next dimension is what can I influence? I can't control it completely, but I can at least influence it. And then the rest I need to accept and then I need to adapt to that and manage it accordingly. So what happens a lot with all of us is that we try to control things that we should be accepting, that we have no control over. And that's when we get frustrated and anxious and depressed and whatnot. So we really have to be very, you know, um, to the point of, like, okay, so this is not within my control. There's nothing I can change about this. That means I need to accept it. I can hate it, but I need to accept it for now. Let me focus on the controllables, control the controllables, like taking care of myself, of my children, making sure that things are on track, 
you know, uh, staying in terms of COVID, you can't control the spread around the world, but you can control your own personal uh, behavior that will actually prevent you from getting infected, right? You can't control other people's behavior around you, but you can talk to them. If somebody doesn't have a mask, you're not comfortable, you can tell them, and then you're influencing the situation. Can you please put your mask on because I'm not comfortable? Or can you step away a little bit? You're standing too close to me. I feel like that a lot when I go to Yasmo. <laughs> People are standing too close to me. But you know, if you're not comfortable, you say something. That's when you influence it. The rest, we accept. And then we have, you know, resilience boosters. So we have, like I said, that natural resilience that we possess, and it's kind of almost automatic response to pull us back, back up. But we can do little things to boost the, the vitamin R. Um, first, again, just like with anxiety, a counterintuitive step, um, we have to lean into discomfort of change and uncertainty. We have to accept that it's uncomfortable. It's like when you buy a new pair of shoes and they're beautiful. We've all been there, ladies um, and gentlemen. Um, and you put your foot in and, you know, it still looks beautiful, but it doesn't feel good, you know, because they're still new. They need to adjust your feet. Your foot needs to adjust to it, whatever. But you want to wear them, so you lean into discomfort. Of course, it's not the same thing, but you understand the metaphor. We have to accept that it's going to be uncomfortable for a while uh, and okay fine they'll accept that and let me make the best out of it but because because i'm in this situation i can't get out of it right so let me make the best out of it have a sense of purpose always you know if you're chasing happiness good luck right happiness is hard to chase and catch and keep whatever so i i'd rather focus on joy joy is more tangible you know feeling little you know pieces of joy every day or bigger pieces of joy, but definitely making sure that we have a sense of purpose. That that actually makes a life a good life, right? As long as you have purpose and as long as your activities are meaningful, your social engagements are meaningful, whatever you're doing is meaningful, you will feel better. I'm not saying happier for sure or happy, but definitely better than when you feel like you don't have purpose. And sometimes if we are not feeling good, then we focus on, you know, um, providing service for others. And that will actually give, give us the boost, okay? So then we focus on the children. And we focus on part, uh, spouses. Then we focus on parents. You know, focus on others. And that will, you know, give us back some energy. Uh, keeping things in perspective, you know, when things become too big, too tight, too ugly, zoom out literally you know it's almost like google earth you zoom out see it a little bit from above a bird view change that perspective and try to maintain a realistic but hopeful outlook right i'm not saying be super positive like think that everything will be amazing but you know give it a chance right so things things will work out let's just let's just you know keep um you know be optimistic and then focus on your strengths, right? Like not on your weaknesses. Like what, what is it that helps me, helps me go through adversity? Like I have been already through some difficult stuff, maybe not the pandemic, obviously, but like similar stuff, you know, personal challenges and I have overcame it. So what happened then? What did I use? The strengths that I have, I have them, I possess them already, they're there. I can use them again. And self-compassion is just such a great, great tool, but it's so neglected, you know, uh, because we're not socialized into being nice to ourselves. We're socialized and raised to be polite and nice to others, but not necessarily to ourselves. So this is really that kind of kindness you have for others. You should be directing it towards yourself as well, right? Giving yourself support, understanding, patience, and compassion. And, you know, we just keep going. What else? And this is my last slide. Um, just as a, as a kind of, um, you know, like a last little uh, message. Um, it's a marathon. This whole situation, it's not a sprint. So in marathon, we know we have to have energy for a longer period of time. We don't have to, 
you know, run at high speed <laughs> because it's not 100 meters. These are many, many kilometers we're talking about. We're still not yet, you know, at the finish line. So we need to pace ourselves for sure. And there's some endurance that is needed, right? Like we need to last longer. That means we have to keep adding to our cups. You can't pour from an empty cup. So when you see that your cup is nearly empty, you have to pour back some energy with self-care, with connecting with others, taking that mindful walk, treating yourself with something, being self-compassionate, as in, you know, like it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, you're, you got this and have the determination to you know reach the finish line because there's absolutely no other solution right so you have to do the marathon till the end but let's do it in a way that you know keeps us preserved and sustainable and not kind of damages in the process so i think this is the whole the, the big bigger message i would say just you know, pace yourselves, preserve energy, and, and have a little bit more patience till this thing is over because it's just not over yet. Thank you so much for listening. I've been talking a lot. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Vedrana. Um, I'm hoping you're still with us because you froze a little bit there. Um, so what I might do is remove you and then join you in a second. Hopefully your um, internet has has come back on. Um, I just want to say before I bring Dr. Vajrana back on, um, a thank you from the Cranley Community Committee. Um, a thank you from Cranley. Um, thank you from myself. I took so much away. I was literally writing down all of these um, all of these ideas um, for myself um, as a teacher, um, as a mum. Um, as a mid 30 year old, which I don't always like to <laughs> acknowledge, um, but there were so many ideas. I was jam packed. I couldn't write it all down. So thank you so much. What I'm going to try and do is bring Dr. Vedrana um, on again, and hopefully her um, internet has sorted itself out. I'm not sure. Oh, she's a little bit ro robotic. <laughs> oh, I think she's back. Um, she may need to um, leave and, and come back on. But but while um, she does that, well, obviously, uh, there was a few questions coming in, um, I know, from backstage about um, and actually linked to the CIA um, model, the acceptance model that uh, Dr. Vedrana was talking about, about how do we actually manage um, other people's expectations as well? Do we feel that we have to do that? And actually, given the current pandemic, I feel exactly the same. Um, you know, I don't really go out that much. And when I do, I feel the same as Dr. Vedrana said, in the sense of, um, you know, how do I manage other people's expectations? Um, so I think we're back now. And I might ask this question to her. Hi, Dr. Vedrana. Yeah. Yeah. Is this working now? I'm sorry. I changed. No, it's my perfect. Mind. Okay, so this is better. It's perfect. And, I, and I'm glad it didn't happen when you were doing your presentation. Yeah, how <laughs> lucky, right? Uh, I was just saying, one of the questions um, was linking, actually, that something that I learned from your um, from your presentation was about the acceptance model, the CIA kind of concept. Yeah. And one of the questions was actually, how do we, especially to our children, and I understand this because I feel the same, how do we manage their expectations when maybe when we're out um, at things like the Yas Mall or, or different, you know, different areas, how do we manage and explain to them if other people's expectations with this coronavirus is not the same as ourselves in terms of keeping safe? So, you know, for example, um, I felt the same as you in Yasmal, if people get too close. And obviously we have a voice to speak up that we don't feel comfortable or, you know, you know, we can we can manage that as, as a parent. But actually, how do we explain that to our children when they're seeing different behaviours? Um, and that's actually having a negative impact on their anxiety or worries. How would you manage that as a parent? What what discussions and conversation talking points would we use because that's actually becoming, and I'm seeing it a lot as a pastoral lead, that children are more worried about what other families or other children are doing. And the same with parents. How do we manage those expectations for our own family to ensure it doesn't have a ne negative impact on the children that we're directly responsible for? 
Yeah, and, and it, look, this is an excellent question. And, you know, it, it's a question I had to answer for myself. You know, many parents have to answer. And, you know, not just parents, all of us, right? Because definitely, you know, you can't, you know that. You can't control other people's behavior. You can't control the way, you know, you, you, you can't sometimes see it coming, right? Um, and so especially now with more people being out and about, you know, with just like us maybe and our children spotting more reckless behavior. And I told you a little bit about, you know, pandemic fatigue and just people maybe unintentionally becoming uh, a little bit sloppier. <laughs> um, you know, there's not maybe that much control all the time. But in any case, people are just being people. Um, but I keep telling my children and myself all the time, like, you pay attention to what you can control, right? Like, you know, you do the right thing always, right? So, and I always, you know, when they were smaller and, you know, like I had to like explain things in a different way, I used to take their little hands and put it on their head and say like, you use your head always, right? Like you have your head on your neck and your brain is inside and you use your brain, right? Like we have that, like, so it's your head. So other people will tell you different things. Other children will tell you to do certain things. But you would think first, and then you think, is this what I want to do? Is this what I'm supposed to do? And you can always say no, right? So I think it's a very good teachable time also to in general tell them that like there will be always so many influences, but they have to start to feel that integrity right even at the early age you have your personal integrity you know you know what's right and that's coming from home right so that's why we are such role models now more than ever it, it's exhausting i know nobody wants to have that spotlight all the time um as pleasant as it is in the beginning but like just keep repeating these things you know uh the my, daria my daughter who is in school uh I talk to her, like, we keep talking about these things. Is something changing? You know, do you still keep your masks on? How does it feel? Do people talk about it? You know, like, it's not just talking once, but keep talking. I think my biggest message here is, like, you have to keep talking to them, even when they're annoyed, but they still listen. They catch at least, like, 10% of what you're talking about. And then they will watch you in action. So if you're in Yasmo and somebody's standing too close, they will watch you say, can you please step away a little bit because, you know, I'm just not comfortable. Or you will tell your child, you know what, like, let's just pull back a little bit because I think we're standing too close, right? It's always in the moment, especially with children. You can't delay too much that lesson you want them <laughs> to learn, even with older children. It should be in the moment or around the moment. And so just, you know, and maybe at home then discuss, hey, how did, how did you feel today? Did you think that, you know, people were all doing the right thing or was it a little bit messy? How did you feel? Also normalizing discomfort, normalizing that it's scary. Normal, and I always use myself as an example, always. So I'm like, you know, that, that didn't feel comfortable for me. You know, like I was a little bit like, oh, you know, like I just wanted to get out of there, right? So I use these things like, oh, I feel anxious. Like I'm not so, you know. So that's how you also model the language and normalize that there's, there's negative stuff happening and that we have to react to it, but we can't ignore it and pretend. So you're not expecting them to pretend everything is okay, right? But you want them to be reasonable. And I talk to my children always about what's their part of responsibility. Of course, I will take a greater portion as a parent, but there's that little percent that they need to do because I'm not with them all the time. So you have to tell them more than once what you expect from them and then keep checking. And that actually links to, to um, another question about the importance of normalizing language. Um, I know we, we've, we've started to introduce that as young as, um, well, actually FS. So all of our um, pupils from FS1 to sixth form have done a, a well-being survey that we've created with the pastoral leads this term. But it, what I wanted to instill in the pastoral lead is about normalizing language. And, you know, Dr. Fajana, what would you what would you say the importance of that is? Or could you break that down for the community about the importance of normalizing language? Is it something that we should be doing as parents, as a community? What does it look like? And what's the impact of it if, it, if it, we do it correctly? Well, you know, I think this is a very good time uh, to start doing that if, if we haven't doing it, you know, haven't been doing it before. 
because due to the crisis, mental health and language around it and feelings and whatnot has been normalized a lot, right? Like, you know, me as a mental health professional, I always, of course, um, you know, uh, regarded mental health as very important. Um, but now we got this uh, additional spotlight and you know I'm, I'm just so sorry that like it had to come this way but it's there the spotlight is there so it's a good moment to capitalize on that i should say so um no, you, you can't go wrong with talking about it or normalizing it and as parents or as adults modeling that and it, i always talk to my children about the struggles i had um you know as as um you know, growing up or in school, like whatever is kind of close to their age, that it wasn't just such a breezy experience. Uh, and what I learned from it, and you know, that I got this far, that, you know, it's fine, people make mistakes. But also to, you know, kind of say that it's okay to not be okay all the time, but that it's also really important to talk about it, to share it, because you can't help them as a parent if they don't tell you what's going on. You know. uh, and yeah, I would agree with that. And I think, um, you know, I know as a parent and as an educator, sometimes it's scarier going in to the conversation, first of all, but actually the impact and the positive you know, outcomes from actually taking a dive and taking that risk to have those conversations is what we need to focus on. And leading on to that, um, we've had a question about um, anxiety um, yes. and especially more for older children. So, yeah. you know, we, how do we support a very anxious older children without them feeling like, you know, we're telling them off or we're trying to tell them what to do? And obviously, I'm not saying obviously, but for younger ones, sometimes they're a little bit more responsive. They're happy for you to take their time and talk about things and sit on the sofa and have a cuddle. But with the older ones, it can be for parents a little bit harder. And obviously, you've now got older children. So yeah. um, how do we support very anxious older children without them feeling like we're always watching them or telling them off? Um, you know, it, it has to be this uh, kind of like touch and go, you know, um, experience. And it can be very frustrating for parents. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I have a 13 year old. Like, of course, it's frustrating to, to deal with teenagers, also as professionals, let alone parents, because there, there's not much coming back. Right. But they do still have so many needs. They, 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 they are at this really sensitive um, kind of like molding period you know like very mellow in some way and like moldable as well but also just um you know um very very sensitive and so i think um just being um respectful of of their boundaries uh but also at the same time uh bringing in the conversation and saying listen you know i don't want to um actually i don't want to be annoying at all and i'm probably am but you know i just want us to talk a little bit about like what's going on you know like how is and you can start with neutral questions like hey how was school today like what, what's been happening um is it is it boring is it like how do you feel like you know was it easy difficult so i always start with that like just like around like neutral topics like nothing to like no danger zone and then you pick up the cues a little bit and you're like you know and you know how are your friends doing and then they might say, like, well, I, I don't know, like, nobody talks anymore or, you know, or like, I think they're doing better. I don't know what's wrong with me, you know, and then you can go deeper, right? So you always start a bit shallow, but you have a, you know, you have a silver lining, like you, you want to follow the thread a little bit, but you have to start shallow somewhere, like not too deep, not like, okay, what's wrong with you? Why are you that way? Like, you, you know, you make me look like a bad parent. We can't do that, right? Like that leads to nowhere. I know it's sometimes what we want to say, but we have to take, like pace ourselves again, but start shallow, but then don't leave it until you get to the point you want to get. And always, leave the door open. If they don't want to talk and they kind of hate you in the moment and they're like, just please leave the room. If they even allowed you into the room, like, you know what, if you change your mind, you know, I'm always there. Like I'm always willing to talk. Like I had a struggle with, you know, sometimes helping with homework when I'm too tired and my brain literally switches off. Like after 8 PM, don't ask me to do any homework for anybody. So I had to have that conversation with my kids and say, if you want me to help you with anything, I'm happy to, but it has to be before 8 p.m. Because after 8 p.m., like, 
my brain is like useless. So I make a joke out of it, but they got it. And I think that's what it, you know, like you said, going back to, you know, we are, and that puts pressure on us as parents. We are constant role models as well, but it also links to having, you know, like you just said, having that self-compassion, kindness and self-care that actually past 8 p.m., you know, you're not going to be helpful anyway. It could be a vicious cycle yeah. in terms of to help and getting it wrong and then it's you've upset someone else etc etc so it's definitely having that fine balance with being a mum and a parent and doing everything you can but actually being kinder to yourself and it's role modeling that behavior so they yeah. see that as well actually working past a set time isn't always productive it depends on the person what you're doing but um that's really helpful and I think um, linking just to that you did explain really really successfully the definition of anxiety and I know what what we've been finding in school is trying to explain to parents and children the difference between anxiety and worries. Or is there a difference? Because there has been obviously with the current situation, an increase of the use of word of anxiety. And I think it's important as a community to understand is the same with bullying and unkindness. I feel there's a difference. And, you know, is there a difference with anxiety versus worries? You know, is there a is there a, a, a kind of a scale as such? And I know everyone's unique, but is there anything you can offer to parents to reassure them of the difference between worries and anxiety or how they're linked? Absolutely. Look, in, in mental health, like for any, and, and I spoke about anxiety in the context of normal reaction to abnormal circumstance, right? Not in clinical sense. Like this is all outside of clinical range. Now, for us to say that something is within clinical range, it has to severely impact somebody's functionality, right? So you can you can live with a, a quite a bit of anxiety and have a great life. You can live with depression. You can live with any any other disorder and have a great life, right? As long as it's not here, like standing in your way. So the moment it anxiety is here. You can't like you can't see right like if it's here if it's here it's fine right like you can carry on so in terms of worry versus anxiety it's actually almost one uh, it's very fluid but worries are the most prominent symptom of anxiety right so this is what the mind does this is that response and like i told you it's from the caveman era it's the, the kind of us getting ready not to get killed you know if you leave the cave, the big animal comes. So this is that kind of thinking. And we're still stuck in that, you know, surprisingly. I think it's amazing. <laughs> like, really? We didn't move from there? Uh, but, like, now it's not the big animal. It's, like, the virus. It's losing a job. It's illness. It's I don't know what, right? Like, worrying about children going the wrong way, whatever it is. So worry, they, they preoccupy us and then they actually take all the other energy and then we can focus on other stuff. Then it becomes serious. Like if you worry a little bit and like, oh, and then you forget to worry, you're fine. But if you constantly, this is predominantly what your day consists of, constantly worrying about millions of things, like you go really far. Not like, oh, worry about, oh, did I buy milk? Oh, did I, you know, make lunch? No, not that. That's normal. We all worry about that. But like bigger stuff. Then you have to look into it a little bit more. But worrying itself, the portion of it, is healthy. It's fine. It keeps us on our toes prepared. Thank you so much. And um, this is a great question that's coming from a parent. Um, and actually, I can relate to this. I think it's really, really important, especially with the younger ones and development. And how can we share our experiences with younger children while preventing them mirroring our feelings and behavior? So, yes, we spoke about role modeling and we spoke about normalizing behavior and being transparent. But actually, how can we share these experiences um, without them not taking the negative aspects, but without them mirroring those, you know, concerning feelings and behavior. And I know I can relate to that with having such a young child. Yeah. You know, uh, what sometimes helps is, you know, telling stories, um, you know, that you can kind of like add some fantasy to it, but still keep it real, right? Um, you know, about a little dog who was sad one day. And then, you know, like you, you can make stuff up in that sense and then kind of give over the message you know to something that's like a, a little bit more um 
you know, gentle in that sense, a little bit less real, but still to the point. Uh, and just, you know, and, and maybe just always adding some encouragement, like, you know, we are, I don't know, we're stuck in the house now, but you know what, like, we'll be so happy once we can leave. So what would you like to do once we can leave? Fantasy, right? And this is not just for small children. We can all always use that mental escape, honestly. It's recommended. So that's not being delusional. Like let me just <laughs> let me just dismantle that myth. But we also recommend it in therapy. If you can't leave physically, if there's so much around you and you, you're just stuck for a while, you can always live in your head and go to that safe place, as we call it. And you can imagine your favorite place. And maybe it's real one, like your grandmother's kitchen or whatever. Or maybe it is imaginary. But you can do that with your child. Like you know, what, like, remember, you know, remember when we did, and then you talk about it. Like, I talk to my children now about, like, when they were little and, like, funny stories. And we go back in time like that. And it's soothing, but it also reminds them, like, there's, there's good stuff. Now it's like a rough patch, but then before and after, like, it will be fine again. You know, so sometimes moving things a little bit in time and giving it a perspective helps them as well. Like, you know, they're suffering right now, but you know what? It's not going to last forever. I know we, we speak, especially with the younger ones, well, even the older ones, about being creative and imaginative. And we always say, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to. And sometimes as parents and as adults, we don't actually take, we don't take yeah, advice and ourselves. That's, that's such a pity. You know, we all can resort to that. Like imagination is just so healing. Well, um, I don't I don't think there's any more um, questions at the moment from the parents. I have to say I've taken so much, Dr. Vedrana. I've, I've spoken to you before as a parent and, and as a as a professional. And you've always given so much. You're so humble. You're so authentic um, in what you know. Um, but you carry such knowledge. And we are forever grateful to have you as a parent and to have you, you know, as a support um for our mental health and well-being strategy so i just want to say thank you it's been so it's opened my eyes up and i feel i've definitely got some more tools in my tool belt to to take on the winter break and the next term um so thank you once again thank you so much. these are really like more than like the kindest words thank you so much i appreciate it. and i just you know want to thank the parents who joined us and who had questions i'm just so happy um, that it was, you know, uh, engaging even at this time. Um, and also, you know, if anybody ever has an individual question, I'm more than happy to answer. I'm personally not on Facebook. I'm not on social media, you know, because of my job that requires a lot of attention, um, you know, to students and everything. So I have limited ability to cover everything, but I'm more than happy always to talk to anybody. Um, and, you know, uh, Mrs. Williams has my contact details. If any of the parents like have any questions about themselves, children, you might think it's useful. I'm more than happy to help anytime. Thank you so much. I wish you a safe um, and restful winter break. And I'm hoping when, when things calm down that actually we can invite you back and you can see our parents face to face. But thank you once again, Dr. Vedrana, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everybody, and, and great winter break. Thank you.